Welcome to Resiliency Within. I am your host, Elaine miller Karras, and my guest today is Ron Roel. He is a radio show host of 45 Forward, a nationwide internet talk show on voiceamerica.com as well. So I'm so excited to have Ron on the show because here we are. It makes it a little easier on me and probably on you too, Ron, that we both do this on a regular basis. So we are going to hear from Ron because his show is about navigating a successful life as you age. And he didn't know this, but I have a big birthday tomorrow. So it's a perfect show for me to be talking about at this point in my life. But I wanna give you a little bit of uh, information about you know what, what are we talking about in terms of numbers of people aging in America. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit more of the wonderful background of Ron. So what we know is that just over 34% of the US population is aged 50 and over. And the numbers are rising rapidly with the aging of the baby boom generation. And Ron, we were both baby boomers, aren't we? So we, every we single time, <clears throat> As when we were kids in school, the, the schools were over flooded with children. Um, when we're having babies, the hospitals were overburdened by the boomers having babies. And it just seems to keep coming with us as we age. But I think the numbers to me were really interesting as I was doing a little research for the show. So in 2010, the estimation was over the age of 50, 21.7 million. In 2020, 32.8 million. And then they expect that by 2030, there'll be 38.6 million. So that's a lot of people. And that's also a lot of people that can be doing a lot of wonderful creative things in the world. I sometimes think our media thinks that no one does anything below the age of 40. And I think Ron and I are a testament that that may be not true. So, but I wanna tell you a little bit more about his, his, his life and his biography. So Ron is a veteran journalist, author and radio show host who is passionate about promoting successful aging across the generations and providing useful information, pragmatic solutions and compelling stories to help people explore rewarding experiences throughout their life. So Ron spent 20 years as a writer and editor at Newsday, Long Island's, Long Island's daily newspaper. And I love that you founded Act Two, and that was paper's weekly section for read, readers age 50 plus. You've been doing this for a long time, thinking about, okay, what are we going to do when we're getting older here? Exactly. So um, he is also... Um, written about, extensively about um, aging topics. He's uh, spoken at numerous conferences and on radio and TV shows. And he's currently active in several organizations that support seniors, including Alzheimer's Association of Long Island Chapter, for which he serves. I love this, that you're the community educator. Maybe you can tell us a little bit sure. about what a community educator does. Sure. And also the, Na the National Aging um, in Place Council. But as an a volunteer to ARP Long Island, he has advocated for seniors across New York before state, before lawmakers, not, on, not only in Albany, which is the state capital of New York, but in Washington, DC. And over the course of his career, he's developed a strong interest in supporting family caregivers. I'm especially interested in that. I've taken care of a number of our family members as, as they've been at the end of their life. And um, he and his four brothers took care of their mother for over 20 years, which I think is so wonderful because sometimes boys don't do that. I don't say all boys, but that is wonderful that you and your right. brothers did that. And so he is working right now and I can't wait to read it when it's done. The Caregiving Navigator, How to Plan, What to Do and Where to Turn When Caring for Your Aging Loved Ones and Yourself. He's expecting to be completed with this in 2022. So you're going to have to let us know when it's out. I'm going to have to have you come back and talk about the book. Will do. He also has a fabulous pedigree of his education. He went to Yale um, and he has a master's degree from Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania. So we've got a person here with us today that has a whole lot of expertise. So Ron, I'm going to ask you a question to start out with. Sure. And that is, what made you passionate? What made you decide that you wanted to really um, um, give people information of how they can cultivate their well-being in their life after the age of 50? Well, not surprising. <clears throat> There's a personal origin story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I want to hear this personal yeah, origin so, story. Well, yes. Yeah. So it started when I was finishing up my career at Newsday. And um, um, I, I was a business editor and reporter. And uh, I really liked the, the wide range of topics that we could cover in business. And, and one day... Um, you know, as an editor, you don't have a lot of extra time, but I said, well, I have a little extra time. I, you know what? I'm going to go to this 
seminar on financial planning. See what they have to financial planners have to say. So this is in the early two thousands, and so the, the he was actually giving a, a workshop on retirement planning. So um, you know he started saying to the, the audience, which was mostly older, um, "How long do you think you're going to live?" You know, and people said, "Well, you know, I don't know hopefully 75, 80, 90, I don't know. <clears throat> How long do you think your your grandchildren are going to live?" And, you know, and then it came up with like, they might live to 125. We don't know exactly. So um, clearly, you know, the, 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 the question came up of, well, the, the usual question, which is, am I going to run out of money, you know, in my retirement? And then I started thinking, okay, that's, yes, that's a valid question. But what about the rest of your life? What are you going to do during this period of life? Because I was getting ready I felt to make a move myself and I was not going to retire. So I started thinking that, you know, this is the wrong model, you know, of work to retirement. And then, or this notion of, you know, you, you go through a certain, you know, structure and, you know, you get a school, you get a college, you get married, you have a career, you have kids, and then you retire. I'm like, no, 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 no. What, what we do is, we have the ability to live a vital life in chapters all the way through. So um, shortly after that, I, I, so I started this section, you know, act called Act Two at Newsday, which covered a whole range of topics, you know, uh, financial, health, work and family, um, recreation, travel, everything. Um, and then shortly afterwards, I took my Act Two. <laughs> realizing that the newspaper business was going through uh, not growing pains, but diminishing pains. Um, and I started doing, a, you know, writing about the subject. And, and the more I did, the more I realized how incredible people's lives were after 50, after 60, after 70. Um, and in fact, um, uh, Elaine, you mentioned, so I, I do a, a radio my, my Voice America radio show is on 45 Forward, and one of my guests um, was a, a, a New York Times reporter who did a book called um, Happiness is a Choice You Make, and which was about spending a year with, with uh, six people 85 and older, because that's actually the fastest growing demographic among older people. Um, and, and he discovered that it wasn't about you know, decline and complaints about health and, you know, you know, whining every day, people made a choice to, to live vital lives, no matter what was happening to them. And so that's what I, I, I really feel strongly that, that, um, you know, we, we, we need a different model, and we need, you know, an unretiring model. <laughs> because the other thing that people have discovered in, in, from studies is that many people who retire and do nothing soon die. <laughs> because there's nothing, you know, one of the, the, the critical elements of this part of life is you have to a, con a continuing sense of purpose, whatever that is. Yes. Purpose and meaning, I, I really have found to be true. Exactly. And I want to make sure that people know that they can listen to your podcast um, on 45 and over. That's the name on Resiliency Within. And we're on a number of different platforms, our shows. Um, so I also want to say, Ron, did we both start our talk shows um, when we were in our 60s? Could that be true? Um, did you start Voice America? Was it before that? Um, it, I was <laughs> I was barely in my 60s. <laughs> okay, I, I love that. He was barely in his 60s. I can say I was in my 60s. So yes. now if you would have told me when I was younger, oh, Elaine, one day in your life, you're going to have a radio show on Voice America. I'd say, oh, I don't know. I can't even imagine that. But I think mm. that what you're saying is that there is a creativity and a generativity that can happen. Also, my kids were grown by the time I was 50. So then I could spend, I mean, what am I going to do with that? I have, I had a meaningful ideas about careers. I was living a, a career that I loved, but I think also when I turned 50, started a new phase of my life. And that's when I personally started the nonprofit, the Trauma Resource Institute, that is a sponsor of the show. And it is in 75 countries. It's wow. in like 43 states. I mean, so- that didn't happen when I was 20 or 30. That yeah, happened they're... after 50. So I guess I'm rewriting a script about that. So what would you say about that? I'd say that is going to be, you know, the new um, generative type of, of life. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, 
this is why I, you know, I know you, you have to let people, young people lead their lives and discover things themselves. But, um, you know, when I, when I hear talk about, well, what am I going to do for my career? What, am, you know, I think <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> you, Isn't it true? Yeah. <laughs> and, and most people, when you, and when I interview many people on my show now, um, I, I, I said, well, don't tell me your, your, your story. Give me your journey. And most of them be, began doing one thing and they're doing nothing remotely like that. You know, sometimes, sometimes you do, sometimes you do. Uh, but it often takes different wrinkles. Um, and, I, you know, I think as I think back, um, you know, even as we were just talking, think, I was thinking back to my parents who actually not intentionally, I don't think, but gave me a model for this, you know, in the background. So, you know, my, my mom and dad had a fairly traditional marriage. <clears throat> my mom was a young woman. She was barely 20 when she had our, the first of us, first of four boys in quick succession. Um, so her young uh, married life was taking care of us, but she was a very bright, you know, creative, uh, artistic woman um, who, who was a Cuban of Cuban origin, but she was like, yeah, I know I'm a Latina, but I, I have a lot of ambition. <laughs> and so when we got to high school, she, you know, started as a teacher, you know, she, she got reeducated, she got her master's, she relaunched herself. And she, and she sort of kept growing. And my father, you know, not the same way, but, you know, by circumstance, um, you know, worked for, a, you know, an aerospace company for 26 years and then was laid off. So in his 50s, he had to reinvent himself. So I think this has been happening more and more. We just haven't talked about it that much. But I think that's the way a lot of our lives are going to go. And we should be, you know, thankful for it because, you know, it's, it's richer, you know, as, as you said, you would, you never thought about doing this when you were that age. And in some cases, you couldn't have done it at that age, because you didn't have the experience and the know-how. That's know -how. exactly right. That's exactly right. And I, you know, I'm thinking as you're telling me about your mom, my mom was also, we, Ron and I share a, a, a Latin background. My mother came from, to this country from El Salvador. And I remember when I was in grammar school, she decided she wanted to teach Spanish. And so she, they had a requirement in the state of California at that time that you had to take Spanish in grade school. So she started teaching Spanish at the Catholic school that I went to. Oh. And I mean, and I think she really enjoyed it. The kids enjoyed her, but I wasn't, she wasn't one to uh, shy away from challenges, but I, you're reminding me of something too. Um, my, my mom was so spicy. She had such a big joie de vivre and she, <laughs> She died when she was about 85. And, um, but when she was about 80, we went to New Orleans. And my memory of her right now, is I'm, as it, it sparked as you were talking about your Cubana mother, right? right? Is that my mother's going down the street of New Orleans and people are throwing her the beads, <laughs> covered in beads. And this young man who's about 25 starts talking to her because she had that kind of charismatic personality. And you would have thought she was 20. I mean, wow. she was talking to this young man and she was having such a lively conversation because she didn't stop thinking and living and being because she was 80 years old. Exactly. So, exactly. and I think that's something mm -hmm. that I really want the individuals to hear from us. You may think, oh, well, now you're over 40. Is it really over 45 or 50? Well, my goodness, look at how gener the generativity that you've had that I've had as we have gone into our 50s. So that's yeah, exciting. Right. And, and that kind of brings me to my next question that I wanted to ask you. So, you know, resiliency and well being is so important. And I know that many times we have these stereotypes of, you know, people, you know, being so physically ill in their their later years and they that really is limiting and certainly there's some people that that is their lived experience but right. there's also like you were saying this incredible spark of well-being and resiliency can you talk a little bit about that and what your your journey has has taught you about that yeah well i think what i've learned um you know what one of the things i i do is I, so just going back to my, my role as a community educator for the Alzheimer's Association, um, which I'm not the only one, they, they have many volunteers who do this, but I, so I produce, a, I present um, uh, a webinar called um, Healthy Living for Your Brain and Body. And it's basically not about, all, you know, dementia as, you know, dealing with dementia, but basically what we can do to forestall dementia or create resiliency in our life so that um, we can reduce the risk of this. And, and so, you know, between, um, you know, exercise and um, 
uh, better nutrition and uh, social engagement and cognitive stimulation, you know, we have a tremendous amount of control over how we age. Um, and, and it's, you know, some of it, of course, is determined by genetics, yeah. but there are things we can do, especially exercise um, in, in, in any kind of form that can really keep us vital for many years. Um, and in fact, you know, do things that we didn't think were possible before. There, you know, there was, at least when I was growing up, a notion that, you know, you, you, you got to adulthood as a young adult and you have all the brain cells you have and that was it. And whatever happens after that is just decline and, and losing mental capacity. And so there's a good bit of evidence now that shows that, in fact, you know, if you exercise your brain, so to speak, by doing, you know, challenging things, learning new languages, learning new hobbies, doing new things like what you're doing, starting, you know, creative projects, you actually start generating new pathways in your brain and start revitalizing parts of your brain. So that even that's not, you know, uh, no longer the stereotype of basically, oh, I'm getting old and, you know, I can't remember things. And, you know, th there, there is some of that. Yes, I think as we get older, <laughs> there probably is something to the notion that our, our brain is like a, an overstuffed file cabinet. <laughs> so, so <it's> st <laughs> Too many things in it, but. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, so it's there, it's there. It's just in the back of the, back of the cabinet. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know if I shared with you, but my father-in-law lived with me and my husband for almost 30 years. Mm. And he died when he was 105 in 2019. And he was a big, uh, he was very active. He walked every morning. And even when he was having some problems with his ambulation, he walked around the neighborhood with his walker. He didn't care. He just was so active always. But the other thing that he did was crossword puzzles. Mm -hmm. And I know they've said that when you do crossword puzzles, that's one of the exercises for your brain, right? right. That helps to stimulate the brain. And he was so sharp. Um, he, um, he didn't lose some of his faculties until he was maybe 103. Wow. Um, and that was because he had some health conditions that I think contributed to that. Right. But right. I mean, imagine that to be as old as he did. And he was sharp as a tack. Wow. So, and I often think it was the exercise and his crossword puzzles, at least he, and he was a clean liver. He yeah. would, um, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke. And he also believed in going to the doctor every year to make sure that you were okay. And he Absolutely. did that since he was a young man. Right. And right. Um, his name was Ken Karras. He was a lovely person, but I guess he's an example of what you're talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and the other thing that, you know, uh, is that um, is to think about aging in a in a basically holistic way. In other words, I think that you know we think too narrowly. You know, I, I understand we we are an economically driven society, so we tend to think about you know financial planning. You know, do we have enough money to live through retirement? How however you know long that is, however long we live, we're never quite sure. Um, I think you know a lot of financial planners now routinely put together plans for people a hundred you're going to assume you live to a hundred um but yeah. uh, but you know as you and i've talked in the past uh, you know so one other thing is is thinking about it more holistically like okay you know there's a book called the number that done by this reporter i believe he's from forbes but uh you know about looking for the number what is, what what's the number what do i need to retire and of course, well, the magic takes, number to retire. Is that yeah, what yeah, about? yeah, okay. yeah. So of course, he goes through this whole book, and the final chapter he realizes, you know, it's a quixotic venture. There is no number. It depends on how how, how do you want to live. You know, what do you need? How do you want to live these years? What's important to you? What are your priorities? Um, and those these are questions that good financial planners do ask people. You know, uh, but but you know, so thinking about. Um, you know, the notion of how, how it is I want to live these years in, in a bundle of areas. So there's finance, there's health, there's housing, you know, there's sociability. Um, you know, what kind of life do you want to have? You know, in some ways, yes. you know, you're, 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 you're free of the other restraints you had growing up. You know, you don't have that structure. So what structure do you want? And you can kind of hopefully create some of that, right? That structure that you want. But is this what you call, you um, define your specialization as successful aging? Um, yes. Is that what we're talking about? What it is. is successful it is. aging. So maybe you can say a little bit more about that because I, really, I love the word successful aging. So how do we, since I'm going to have a big birthday tomorrow, Yeah. <laughs> I need to know about successful aging. I'd love to live for another couple 
decades if yeah. possible or you more. Know, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's basically, you know, the success is determined by you. That's the, that's the key. And each of us is unique and it is true. I mean, you have to determine how you define success, you know, what's important to you. Um, and, and so, so it, it's, are you doing something that is purposeful and meaningful? And are you doing it in a way that enables you to do it? So you, are you successful because you've, because you've, you've done some planning, you know, one of the, the, the in our uh, earlier conversation, I was talking about, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. So no. the best thing is to prepare, but don't predict. So prepare, I want to say that again, prepare, but don't predict. That sounds very important. Right. So to be successful, you do need some preparation. You need to think about it because you're going to, you know, one of my analogies is that, you know, we, the life has lots of you know, twisting turns that we can't predict. And, you know, and, and so you have to prepare for them. And the way you have to prepare is just the way you're driving a car going into a curb. Got to slow down, yeah. <laughs> slow down and, and, and navigate the curb and then take a few moments and say, okay, what do I need to, to do to be prepared for aging? So there are some pragmatic things too, besides, you know, doing some discernment about who you are and, and who you want to be with, when, you know, I mean, with your family, your friends, where, you know, wh what kind of housing do you want? What, what's important to you? Um, you know, so, so there is that, you know, and is some estate planning too. Right. I mean, that's that's an important part of it um, to be successful, you know, uh, in in living that life that you want to live and to be as enriching as possible. So, you know, it's 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 successful in that your your needs are taken care of in the way that you want to. Um, and uh, and basically, uh, you know, this uh, organization that I belong to, the National Aging in Place Council, you know, people talk about, oh, so you want to age in place and home and and they're. Um, a theme is, well, we, we want you to age in place wherever you want to age in place. So, you know, you may want to be in assisted living or you may need to, that, that, that's okay. Um, maybe your home that you raise your family in is no longer the appropriate place for you, you know? Well, I think you do have to think about mobility. And I know that was a problem with Grandpa Kenny is that he, he couldn't go upstairs anymore. We, so we had to really be mindful about the space that he had that didn't have any steps right. because that was also about his safety. So there are pragmatic, practical things to think about, but if you think about them now, wouldn't, I mean, maybe before you have ambulatory issues, you could also create a space that takes that into consideration. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So so basically looking, uh, taking some time and, and looking at your house and, and saying, okay, you know, I, as my wife and I have with our house, like, you know what, we've been here a while, we could downsize, but we like this place, we like it, you know. Um, so what do you need to be successful? And, and part of that is another S word, safe and secure. Um, so you start thinking about, well, as I get older, I, um, do I have grab bars in the bathroom? Uh, are the doorways wide enough in case, you know, one of us becomes less ambulatory needs, you know, wheelchair or so forth. A lot of these things are actually, you know, designed for older people. But when you really look at them, it's like, you know what, these are good ideas for any age. <laughs> you well, know, it's a little bit extra safety, right? No absolutely. Matter. Yeah. You don't have to be 80 to fall down in the bathroom. No. You know, you know it, 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 that could happen. So, so a lot of these, and there are people who are, um, you know, aging in space uh, place specialists that you can find. Um, if you just Google them, you'll find them in your area. And what they do is that's what their specialty is coming into your house and saying, okay, uh, what do you need to age in place as you get older? What are the, um, you know, what are the, the risky areas? I mean, as you get older, some of the things you do need to change, like, like have fewer throw rugs because you can trip on them. You know, make sure that, you know, you don't have cords going across the room, which are not good for people of any age, <laughs> but, but, but so they will have do to be a little bit extra careful. But I also wanted to bring in besides these specialists, that's uh, we, when Grant Kenny was sick at one point, he, he was weak. And so we got a referral of an occupational therapist from his healthcare plan and they came to our house and they gave us that exact, those exact suggestions of how we could increase his safety by doing some very simple things like 
bars in the shower, like a higher toilet, I mean, or a toilet seat um, that he didn't have to, you know, sit down in the same way, right? Right. Things that were very simple for us to do that increased his, um, his comfort and his mobility. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, as you, as things do change, you said, you know, you can, you can plan, but you can't predict what's going to happen to you. And so you do suggest developing an integrated plan for each stage. Let's say, as you get older, it may be different from 50 to 60 than it is from 60 to 70 or 70 to 80, 80 to 90. So can you talk maybe a little bit about what we need to think about in terms of those different, different, um, different age periods? Sure. Um, well, I think that, you know, as you um, get to, um, you know, your 50s, you know, it is a time to start thinking ahead at where you want to live, you know, and, and what kind of lifestyle you want. I mean, do you want to stay in age in place? Or do you do you, you want to move to some other, you know, downsize or go to some other part of the country or, or, um, you, you know, do you, do you uh, if you have grown kids at that point, do you want to be near them or do you want them to be near you or so I think uh, as you start thinking about um, the you know I think the empty nester stage is certainly one time when you start thinking about um, location Um, you know the um, uh, um, the other thing is you know at the same time I think you should start thinking realistically about um, you know are you going to continue in your career are you going to downsize your career? Are you going to, you know, or, or do you want to start thinking about um, doing something that um, you've always wanted to do but didn't do before? Um, you need to start planning that. Well, what's what? Sometimes you need. It takes a little bit of a while to to unwind. Um, so you, you're unwinding if you've been with a company for a while. At that age, you need to start thinking about. Well, what do I have a pension? Do I have four hundred one k? Do I need to tie up things at work? There, there, uh, there are lots of things that you may have to uh, think about a year or two before you actually, you know, retire from your, you know, your, your you know, long range job. Well, I'm going to ask a question that's connected to what you just said, because we're talking about if you have a pension plan or 401k, that's really a person of advantage, right? That, right. But many people, I was reading something, live from paycheck to paycheck right. and they don't have, they haven't planned um, for the future. So is there anything that you have learned that can help those that don't have those, those kinds of assets? Can they have some agency about how they may want to think about their, their, their future as they age? Yeah, I think, I think you do need to be pragmatic about what your, what your financial assets are and, and, and where, um, where, you know, where, how are you going to support yourself and, and thinking about a different kind of a lifestyle, a much simpler kind of a lifestyle. Um, so you may, that may sort of force a decision like, well, maybe the equity that I have, the assets that I have are in my house. So maybe the idea is to sell the house and, and you know, get a small house. My last guest um, uh, last, earlier this week actually was about um, moving to tiny houses. You know, this whole phenomenon. Oh, those little teeny tiny houses. Yeah, yes. yeah, tiny or smaller houses. So do you want to free up some assets to do that? I think, uh, you know, um, so, you know, you, you are, you know, constrained by finance, but then th- there are, so there, there are other ways to, th- to age in that, in that circumstance, Elaine. So, so housing is a big one, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, where are you going to live? Right. And, and how are you going to support that? The, because a lot of it is about maintaining that lifestyle. So there are alternatives coming up too, about, you know, uh, you may, um, there, there are other alternative housings. There's things like co-housing. There are all sorts of alternative housing developments coming up, uh, you know, on, on the horizon that you might want to consider. I mean, you may have to think about moving to a, a low-cost state. Um, uh, so, um, so how do you do that? Well, I think you start doing that in your fifties. And we'll get to the 60s in a little while, but but okay. in the 50s, <laughs> we'll run out of time by the time we, we get to we'll, 90. We'll get to where we are right now in our 60s. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But but um, it, so it takes, again, it takes some planning. So where are you going to be? Well, you should probably start taking some vacation time and spending a week in, in one area or another to see, well, do I really like this place? Could I stay here? Um, is this a place that I could successfully retire and, and be happy in? 
Um, so, you know, so the, the money is a big thing, but even, even more so Elaine is your health, you know? Yeah. So, so you should really start looking at, um, you know, realistically at what, what health needs you might have. And, um, and, and if you can afford to pay for health care where you are, right. certainly once you get to be a certain age, you get Medicare, but that's also sometimes that's challenging as well, um, depending on what your health needs are. Right. So you, you should really uh, start thinking about Medicare in your 50s to basically understand what it does cover and what it doesn't cover. Um, and then, you know, the what happens you know, it doesn't start becoming an issue until you're usually your mid 60s or 70s, but the issue of long term care, that's something you need to think about earlier. Well, and I also think if you if you do have children, depending on your, your like I was said, Jim, my husband's father lived with us for 30 years. My husband was an only child. We were moving from the Bay Area to Southern California. We he was a regular part of our life every single day. We couldn't imagine him not being in our life. And so what we did is he sold his house. We sold our house. We put our finances together and we bought a big enough house that he could have like a, his own wing. He had his own bedroom and living area and yeah. bathroom. And so, I mean, it's in a, you know, suburban neighborhood, but that was a decision that we, that he made and we made with him. Right. And we were just in our forties then, but it was also about, I think, um, when we age as well is talking to our family and our children because they want, may want to have us near them. Right. And we might want to be near them or maybe we don't want to be near them as well. Right. right? That yeah. can also be part of the equation, yeah. but yeah. I think we, you and I both come from families where I think in our traditions, we take care of elders often in our homes. Right. And right. so, but that also, that's, that's not easy. And I, right. I also did this with my mom. So my mom lived in our house for the last year of her life. Um, I had both actually my husband's father and my mom at the same right. time, right. kind of interesting. They, they were so different, but I think it was really a choice that we also made as their children, but they also made right. to be right. with us. And yes. it wasn't that we were forcing them to come, right? right. We right. had conversations about why it might be a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. And that, so that's one of the essential elements of this caregiving guide that I talk about. At each stage of, you know, aging, you need to have a family conversation. And of course, it's really not one conversation, it's several conversations, but yes. that's the important thing is to, to be in conversation and to be open about on, on you know, on, on both sides, you know, the older parents or loved ones and, and the adult children. Um, which is tough sometimes, you know, I mean, the, these, you know, conversations are, are, can, can be difficult and they can be difficult too, especially if you have several si siblings and you're not on the same page. Um, and, uh, but, but they're necessary that to, to do, to age successfully, you, you have to go through these conversations. You've got to be open and honest and, you know, and your, your parents um, have to, um, be open about where they are, what assets they have, what their resources are, what they're going to need. It's difficult, uh, you know, and certainly in, in my parents' generation, they did not share information like that with us. Yes, no. Um, and so that you, they, it, you do have to have an element of trust um, between the generations. And then on the children's side too, they have to be genuine about their understanding that their their obligation, their responsibility is to make sure their parents are okay, not yeah. about their inheritance. Right. And I think that can get, maybe we can talk about that after we come back from our break. Um, when, um, because I think that's a big thing about the money. And right. maybe we should talk a little bit about that because I've sure. certainly seen that in my own family. Right. And so it's time for us to take our break. And when we come back, we will continue our conversation with Ron Roel as he continues to inform us of how we can have successful aging. So we will be back in a few moments. Welcome back. This is Elaine miller Karras with Resiliency Within, and I'm here with Ron Roel, who has his own talk show, 45 and Forward on Voice America, and we have been having a lively conversation about successful aging, and we're going to continue the conversation that we, uh, we just left, left before the break, and so Ron, I want to talk a little bit about this whole planning, and we were talking about it's not only about inheritance for the children to be thinking about if you're mm -hmm. sitting there hearing about, okay, how can I help my parents? But sometimes it becomes a little dicey about the money. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, it's, um, 
it's something that, you know, a lot of families have issues with, you know, children have different priorities, different needs. Sometimes, um, um, sometimes the needs of some of the children are more than others. So that becomes an, an equity issue. Um, you know, so this comes up a lot with, you know, broader caregiving issues. Um, so, um, you know, I have a, a chapter, uh, actually just a section in, in my caregiving navigator on, I just call it the sibling syndrome. <laughs> and, and it's basically recognizing that families are families. And when money is involved, things change. Things um, change. Yeah. So you have to be, uh, so the, the first thing that comes up is just the issue of um, who's going to be the point person, you know, in terms of the executor of the will, or or if there are trusts involved, um, you know, who are the parents going to designate, um, you know, as among their, well, it could be, it doesn't have to be their children, actually, but, you know, there are certain positions like, you know, appointing a healthcare proxy, you know, appointing a, a power of attorney. So these are pragmatic things you, you should do. Uh, and, and often what happens is when I talk to people about doing it, they, for their parents or, or, or what their parents should do, they realize, oh, I should be thinking about that myself. Um, because, you know, um, once your, your children turn 18, they should have their own healthcare proxy. People don't realize that when they go to college, they should have a healthcare proxy because if anything happens to them and there's no healthcare proxy, you know, healthcare institutions will do what they want in terms of, you know, care for their if, if any kind of catastrophic incident happens. So there's this process where the family needs to be open about this and the parents need to be open about who they want and, and ex explain to their children. You know, we were talking about family conversations um, and they, you know, in some cases, you know, you, you pick one sibling over another and you should have a conversation with them about why. Um, in my situation, it was, you know, we came from a, a traditional um, Hispanic family, but, you know, my older brother was a, you know, terrific person, um, but he was living far away from my parents. Yeah. Um, so I became the, you know, the, the, the second choice, but I was closer and they trusted me. And you do have to, you know, um, you do have to have the trust of your siblings and even with disagreements. So one of the things that I was confronted with, and I think that everyone should really think about is that it's hard to be equal um, in families, but you, what you strive for is fairness. What's fair and, and, and how can you, so even the, my, my brother who was um, um, farthest away was, but he was a doctor. So, you know, I would, we would have conversations and, and thankfully in this day and age, we could do it through, um, you know, Zoom calls. Um, and, uh, or, or uh, you know, collective conversations, you know, conference calls. So we would, I would get everyone involved in these conversations and we would talk it out. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, what you have to do. And again, it's, it's dicey, but it's what you have to do to have, be as successful as you possibly can. You know, yeah. respect for your family, because if you don't, uh, you do see situations, right? It's a where big mess. It's, it's a, a big, big mess. mess. It's and, a big mess after a sisters. lot of hurt feelings. And sometimes they don't talk to each other exactly. after that. But if I think if they have clear ideas ahead of time, that it can make it much easier. And I also just want to put in a little bit of a thought about, you know, it doesn't have to be one of your kids. You can choose someone who's outside the family system. There's even attorneys that will do this and other right. kinds of um, people that are not invested in the the arguments that can happen between between children and other family members so but i think that the more that you think about that in terms of how you love your children right is it's another way that you love them is by planning so that they won't have these you know horrible things and messy things happen after after we go yeah absolutely and that's a conversation that probably parents or what, what sometimes it's not parents it's another loved one but should have with an outside advisor um, so exactly. that it's clear that whatever the plan is, especially in caregiving, um, um, it's 
it's it's the parents who were the clients it's not the adult kids yeah and sometimes um, the adult kids think they should be the, they should be the the clients not the parents right right, right. but that's not the case yeah no that's yeah. not the case and i think that's important but you know i want to see if we can go revisit something because there's something sure. that i you know certainly getting older grappling with and this is the whole idea about when to retire mm-hmm. because i think that there has been this magic age of 65 that was I don't know. You know how that was created where someone came up with the idea of 65. Was that more like a, because of Medicare that we 65 was the magic age or, I mean, it was, I I I think that, I think what preceded it was really a social security. Social security. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and when that magic number was established, it was because actually people, the, the, the longevity was about 67. So they didn't think that. Yeah. So longevity is longer than that now. So, right. A lot. But I think the thing that that I really wanted to highlight about what you said, and I think it's so important, is about purpose and meaning. Because I have seen as I've traveled around the globe, that if we lose our purpose and our meaning, that we lose our joie de vivre, we we lose sometimes our, our compass. It's like we don't know what to do with ourselves. And so that it, there isn't to me that magic number. And I was trying to kind of grapple with this because when I turned 65, I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to retire from the nonprofit. Well, I'm going to be 70 tomorrow. And I mm-hmm. obviously have not retired yet and just right. re- decided not to retire mm-hmm. because it was almost like I was thinking that I should retire because of this magic number. And then finally, it kind of really hit me that I know many people in their 70s and in their 80s, for that matter, that have very active lives and continue to contribute and are passionate about what they do, which I certainly am. And so why would I want to retire? Right. right. One of the leading researchers of the, our model, um, the community resiliency model from the Trauma Resource Institute, she's in her mid seventies and she is like, just got a huge award from her professional organization for the research that she's doing. And right. so, I mean, I think she's in a position, her kids are grown, that she can actually dedicate herself to what she really believes in, which I don't think is too different from how I feel and what you're telling me about yourself as well, Ron, here you are, right? And you're, yeah. you, Ron's a year younger than me. I just want you to know. No, I'm no, no. Here. I'm a year older than oh, you. Oh, I thought I was a year. I thought I was a year older. I wanted to pull that senior thing. <laughs> Oh, gosh, no, I, I hit 70. Darn. I hit 70 last year. So oh, darn. that's what I, I mean. Thought... That when you said I'm, I'm barely in my six, <laughs> I meant barely like still in my 60s. I started. Okay. Well, that's what I'm thinking. That, oh, you're like a year younger than me. No. You see, we're, we're, we're bantering over this right now. So cause that's, this is fun. Okay. Now you're my senior. Oh my right. gosh. Oh, if I would have known that I would have had a whole different conversation with you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, um, but, but anyway, I think when we're talking about this is that I think it's just really important about that purpose and meaning. Yeah, I, I think so. And and certainly we've been fortunate in with advances in healthcare and medicine that we've been able to think that way. So so it's it's hard to do it if you're not healthy. It really is. But many of us are healthy and, and many of us even with ailments are, are fine. You know, it's so it's it's a combination of purpose and then part of your um whole theme of resiliency. Yes. Which is that um you can keep going, and and you, and there's a there's a there's a wonderful sense of rediscovery and, and discovering things about yourself that you didn't know, or rediscovering things that you did know. But it's like you know what, there is no reason not to do it now. Right. Um, exactly. And so there, you know, there is, you know, I- inevitably as you get older, there, you know, you, you are confronted with with losses in life. You know, family and friends die. Um, you know, there are tragedies that happen there, you know, you go through health crises and, and hopefully survive. So there are losses, but you learn to live with them. And, you know, you, this is a, you know, a word that I, I haven't started using until recently, but about, you know, surrender, because you don't really think about it, but surrender into yourself. It's okay to be who you are, you know, and stand up for who you are deep and deep inside you and move forward and enjoy this period. And I think that, you know, they're, they're, you know, the stories now are becoming myriad about, you know, people who are doing this. And so mm-hmm. the examples are there, you know, I, I had a, someone early on my show that I, I interviewed when I was at Newsday, we became friends, she was top notch, um, management training consultant. Um, and then, she, you know, and internationally known. And then in her 50s, she decided, okay, I've had enough of this, I'm burned out. She said, I'm going to do what I wanted to do since I was nine. I wanted to be a novelist. I'm going to be a novelist. And you say, well, okay, good luck. Well, 
she did it. And she published her first historical mystery novel at the age of 69. And there's still, she's, you know, six novels later, you know, it's, it's six there for novels you. later. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. She is just, still going. I yeah. love that. And, you know, I have to say, cause I told you, you know, tomorrow's my birthday, but I just finished the second edition of my book. And so here I am in my last day of my sixties going, all right, the same thing. I don't know if there's more books ahead of me. There may yeah, be, yeah, but yeah. I mean, I, I just, I want people to hear that, that, you know, your life's not over because you're getting older. It's actually could just be getting in ways that you never imagined. Right. But um, there's one thing I, I think the hardest thing for me, I have a couple of really close friends um, and one has Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. And I mean, she was one of my closest friends. I mean, we right. would chat all the time and, and, um, and I was trying to get a hold of her. And I called her son. He said, he says, Elaine, she can't use her phone. She doesn't know how to use her phone now. And they actually are one of these folks that were in California and just moved to Texas because it's so much less expensive there mm-hmm. and that she can have many more things that he needs to care for her. I think there than here in California, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's the loss of this friendship where you see the person, but the person is there are some qualities that you see. She like right. she has her sense of humor, um, and but it's different. There's not that the the same. Um, oh, I don't know. It's, I can say that the depth of the conversations that we used to have right. are no longer possible, and yet I care so much for her. Right. And then I have another mm-hmm. friend who is in one of the nursing facilities here in Claremont that I went to visit recently, and she was one of the most little really brilliant women that I've ever met in my entire life, and. Um, she can't speak. And when I see her, I just love her so much. And there's a certain like sadness inside of me that right. this is what happens to some of us. It could happen right. to me. It could happen to you. Yeah. And that's hard for me to grapple with. It is hard. Personally. You know? Yeah. So it is hard. So our mom had uh, Alzheimer's for the last, you know, several years of her life and it is hard. And, um, you know, I wish I had learned earlier i had a couple of guests on who were um uh, one woman who did a book called dementia with dignity and you know so the you know they're working on cures they don't they don't have them they They don't have them yet you know they have one that they you know they have some now a medical treatment that may may attack you know a potential problem of of you know these plaques in the brain amyloid plaques but but at any rate um you know it was a, sort of an inspiring conversation with this woman who started out again she had an interesting career she was a lawyer an elder law attorney and then all of a sudden met her neighbors in rural idaho and um be, began caring for them and um um so with the interesting thing about alzheimer's and dementia is that um, you know, it, it's to be able to appreciate that the person has lost their cognitive abilities, right? Um, but they haven't right. lost their emotional life, you know, and, and, you know, people, you know, recognize it because they can, Alzheimer's patients, you know, will all of a sudden respond to music, you know, there's certain capacity they'll respond to. And, um, you know, it's, and, and they're living in the present, you know, so, you know, the, the things that that's interesting to me was that, you could appreciate that in, in being with Alzheimer's patients where that's where they're living. You know, they don't have a, a future, they don't have a past, but they're living in the present, which <laughs> ironically is what, you know, we sort of tell ourselves, stop, you know, just live for today. Well, you know, you know what's hap- you're not gonna know what's happening tomorrow, live for today. So that's what they're doing, they're living with them. You so know, you can I, be with them. I, you can be with them in that way. And, you know, I'm glad you, you, you brought that up because my friend that is here in Claremont, she knew Henry, her and her husband were friends with Henry Mancini. So the last mm. time I went in there, I put in um, bre- the song from Breakfast and Tiffany's Moon River. Right. And I just had it over and over with Audrey Hepburn and I could see her. She's listening. She kind of moved a little bit. Yeah. So you could, I mean, I, that did make me feel much better, but yeah. I think we can do things like that. And we also know that body memory. So that dancing, moving, even rocking a baby doll or a stuffed animal can be really helpful. Right. right. Yeah. So it, that to me is sort of a, a greater metaphor for, you know, the obstacles we have later in life, there will always be obstacles, you know, and there will always be, you know, heartbreak um, and there'll always be losses, <clears throat> but you can live and be vital um, in spite of them, you know? Well, Ron, I cannot believe we have, we could talk for another hour. I knew that was going to happen. We're almost to our end today. So I want everyone to know 
how to get a hold of you. Please tell us about, I'd love for you to say the name of your show okay, and when they can listen to it live. And also, I know they can also go to the podcast. So right, over right. to you for the last couple okay. minutes. So my show on Voice America is just called 45 Forward. And if you just Google 45 Forward, you'll it, that that's what comes up first, you know, so it, it airs live um, uh, 12 o'clock noon, your time, Elaine, tw- three o'clock uh, my time on Mondays, uh, every week on Mondays, but then by the next day, it's a podcast and you can just click on and find it as an episode and do what everybody in the country is doing is listening to podcasts. <laughs> Everyone's listening to podcasts. Thank goodness. Right. right, yes. right. And, and you can just contact me at ron.roel at gmail.com. If you have any questions. Or so fun. say it again, say it slower. Ron. Sure ron.roel, R-O-E-L, at gmail.com. Yeah, because you may have somebody out there who's going, I need to be on this show. And he might, they may want to contact you to do that. So uh, that, of course, would be wonderful. But Ron, I want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's so important. And just even, I just feel a, a degree of, um, of gratitude right now is thinking about how I did play Henry Mancini to my friend. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. that I know that helped her very much. Of course, I miss certain aspects of the relationship we had, but there still is a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I need to get down there to see her. In fact, maybe I'll try to do it later today. So there you're inspiring me to do that. But I think that also the work that you're doing with, with the Alzheimer's foundation too. Um, I really appreciate that you're doing that kind of work and bringing your education and knowledge to all of us. So for my listeners out there, Ron Roel is truly, when I say what else is true, that sometimes we suffer, but we also have ways that we can successfully age. And some of the the beautiful wisdom and tips that you give us today, I think are, are those. So if you have an elderly parent, if you're aging yourself, listen to Ron's show, 45 forward. and forward. No, just 45 forward. 45 forward. And you'll get some good tips. So this is Elaine Miller-Karis signing off today. Um, Until next time.